Uh, and we move right away to the next lecture that, as I said, is a, a result of a collaboration, multicultural co collaboration. So uh, we have three speakers. I'll introduce them shortly, even though they deserve uh, a longer one. And then uh, they, they'll uh, talk about the, the project itself. So uh, the, the speakers will be uh, Yuri uh, Klebanov, who was graduated from Bezalel uh, Department of Visual Communication in 2011, and then from uh, got his master's from RCA in London in, in two, that 2016. He's a design and, and technology researcher at, now at U Tokyo Institute of Industrial Science, B DLX Design Lab, focusing on fusion of design and science. Uh, and then Romy Mikulinski, who is the head of, of the Master uh, of Design program in Industrial Design at the Bezalel Academy of Arts and Design in Jerusalem. Her dissertation at the University of Toronto's English department was dedicated to photography, memory, and trauma in literature and film. Uh, Romy Mikulinski also researches and lectures about digital and counterculture algorithmic art as well as design-led innovation. And the third, last but not least, is Tom Reznikov, who is a designer and a creative technologist. Her works were exhibited in exhibitions in Israel and abroad. Uh, uh, she holds a, a BD in design uh, in visual communication from uh, Witzo Design Academy and MDES from, uh, from Bezalel uh, uh, in Israel. And uh, I open the floor for the three of you. Thank you, Sibar, for this lovely introduction. Um, so Tom will be sharing um, the screen and I will start in the meantime. Okay, so hello. Uh, I'm Gomi Mikulinski. I'm the head of the Masters of Design program in Bezalel. And I would like to introduce a project today that we worked on in the past year or so with a team of designers and technologists from the Institute of Industrial Science at the University of Tokyo. <coughs> so here with me are Tom Resnikov, an interaction design, designer and a recent graduate of the design and technology track at the program. And Yuri Glebanov, who is a design researcher at the DLX Design Lab uh, at the University of Tokyo, and this is a collaborative project. Okay, so um, we actually begin our project um, with trust. And this project um, has to do with the fact that design has expanded and now re reaches additional realms. It is no long, longer focused on beautiful or functional objects, but uh, deals and creates systems, feelings, as well as relationships. And uh, this project is dedicated to exploring trust. So trust is a multi-layered concept with acute meanings. And when it comes to introducing new, new technology, we believe that um, designers uh, have a lot to offer in the way that technology rapidly changes and shapes the everyday life. So um, understanding how humans will interact with complex vehicle systems with the entrance of uh, automated vehicles, autonomous vehicles, uh, to the cities and to the everyday has become critical. And as designers and technologists, we believe that design and design methodologies can prepare us for functional, societal, and psychological aspects of autonomous vehicles uh, introduction to our cities. So this project is aimed at showing how design tools can assist in calibrating the adequate amount of trust that is needed for a safe, positive, that will possibly also uh, carve a path for a new approach to interaction between humans and machine. So uh, trust stems from cognitive, emotional, and behavioral dimension. And uh, this project actually began in Tokyo about 18 months ago, where a team of designers from Bezalel, as well as uh, from the University of Tokyo, um, dealt with a um, design challenge in a seven days design workshop. And their challenge was actually to envision the future of transportation. 
So um, you can see here um, all of the, um, the participants in this workshop, Yuri and Tom, Ron Elmol, Ben Lev, um, Naomi Slaney, as well as uh, Guy Blandel and Charlotte Fouet, but there were also several others working uh, in tandem. And we kept working on this project despite COVID has um, started. Okay, so uh, the transformation to autonomous transportation has introduced new conditions and new forms of interaction. And we realized that we also have to create new forms of uh, communication. And uh, the goal we set in this process was also to challenge the exi existing paradigms um, with the human-centered approach in mind. And um, what um, we actually did was to focus on the driver. That is, the transition to autonomous mobility meant one main thing, which is a road with driverless cars, no driver inside the vehicles. So we started with the obvious and then moved on to examine the role of the driver and the possible outcomes which may come from his or her absence. So uh, first of all, we realized that the designer, that the driver is more than just a navigator. He or she are a crucial part in interacting with riders, pedestrians, as well as with other people who share the road um, with the vehicle they drive. And then um, we began mapping the driver's functions and meanings inside the vehicle. And we started with public transportation because we believe that uh, it may have the biggest impact on the environment in the new cities. So from this mapping, we can learn about the interactions that may be missing that exist today. In the, and uh, then we moved on um, to envisioning the next kind of interaction, um, realizing that the role of the, this, of the driver is not just to bring a vehicle from point A to point B, it is an integral part from the riding experience, and that the driver is a mediator between the passengers and everything that happens outside the vehicle, and sometimes also inside the vehicle. So, in other words, um, we try to focus on what was lost in the transition to driverless vehicles and identify four main points. The first thing that we lose is uh, the sense of familiarity. Then um, we will not be able to anticipate the vehicle's behavior because it is no longer humans driving. And from here, we also realize that the sense of authority, safety, and trust will be radically changed. And um, then the mission was to conceptualize new forms of communications, which will be effective, human-centered, as well as universal. And in fact, may humanize technology, make it more human-centered, more nuanced. Um, so in this slide, you can see several contemporary trends that uh, have to do with humanizing technology. These are mostly based on virtual avatars, on humanoids, on literal communication that is projected on the vehicle, or the machine, and uh, as well as the anthropomorphic approach that uh, tries to humanize the machine in an illustrative way. In this project, we actually asked and aimed to create a different experience opposed to the existing ones. Um, so we imagine a scenario in the near future where a person will enter a driverless vehicle alone, no driver and no passenger. And from this um, scenario, we started asking, how can we humanize the way driverless vehicle interacts with passengers? How can we know that, that as a passenger that the autonomous vehicle acknowledge my presence? How can we create a sense of trust with um, public vehicle that has no driver? And we actually meant what we aim to is to create the vehicle itself, its surfaces, its interior, to communicate with the passenger, to become a platform itself. And uh, these are the principles that uh, may guide us in bridging this gap created by the driver's absence and to compensate um, for what we will be missing. So first of all, we'd like to create a sense of acknowledgement of the passenger's presence, to give a personalized information on the travel, to create also a bio-inspired materials and textures and textiles that may create uh, a less alienated feeling and some kind of a dialogue between the passenger and the vehicle that will make sense and will create a stronger sense of community between the passengers. And um, the result is a language and a system that are built to create an emotional, somewhat minimalist, even mellow, uh, and also intuitive 
um, approach that could decrease noise and augment coherence, as well as the sense of trust. And uh, Tom, to you. Hi. Um, so when we started to think about like how it's going to look, uh, we looked for inspiration and then we thought that the natural um, shapes can really help us to create subtle uh, communication. And we thought that the ripple shape will be a good fit. And before even mapping an AV passenger interaction, uh, we looked at the current state between human beings in order to see what we need to make up to and what is the, this communication that we need to um, actually create. So let's take a look. When I get on a bus, I usually nod to the driver, right? And then I wait for him or her to nod back. And that's actually an agreement, an agreed sign that tells me that he knows that I'm on board. And actually a small gesture tell, tells a lot. For example, when the driver is about to start the ride, uh, they will look back to see if all passengers are on board, but this uh, small gesture actually signals us that the bus is, is about to start the drive. So these are the few interactions we picked up as an example for this language that we can develop in the future. So the first interaction here is to receive this acknowledgement uh, of presence from a small uh, ripple motion around the passenger's feet. So there's no driving driver, but the bus tells the passenger that they know it, it, they're on board. Another thing we thought about is to use the grip pole and add personalized information of the um, route or the drive for the passenger. So if you can see the, the passenger can hold the pole and then the information will be presented. And then we started prototyping a little bit just to see like how it feels and we moved forward into another interaction. Um, we thought that maybe when more than one passengers hold the same standing pole, it can integrate a mutual visual interaction between them and then it can create um, overlapping of the ripple and a sense of community or um, just to gain a sense of mutual experience uh, because you're sharing the uh, public ride with someone. And at last, um, leaving the vehicle. So when a passenger gets off board, it can leave a trail of presence that signals to others that it is safe to leave the bus. So just small tests we created again, just to see how it works. But eventually we decided to um, focus and develop the interactive floor concept. And then first, what we did is to map these types of interaction that we can create with the floor. So we can communicate the bus intentions, right? What it's about to do. Um, we can communicate the personalized information about the ride and we can create interactive ambient experience for the passengers while they're riding the bus. Sorry. So for bus intentions, um, we used ripples and animated those ripples in different ways to communicate different things. So as I said before, when the passenger on board, the ripple motion can acknowledge the passenger uh, that he's on board. And then maybe a textual gesture pops occasionally to remind the passenger that they'll need to pay. And when the bus is about to start the drive, Ripple can move up towards the right direction and to imply that it's about to start driving. And, and then vice versa, when it's about to stop, the Ripple can appear and shake uh, towards the passenger to imply that the bus is stopping. And maybe in times like COVID, overlapping Ripples can indicate um, passengers distance from each other, which uh, this information might be useful. And then for um, ride information, we created a visualization that can tell the passenger about um, the ride. So if there are expected delays, what is the reason if the bus has stops and what is the ETA and so on. So I will show you how it looks. So the dots on the line can indicate how many stops the passengers have until the final destinations. What is the weather there? How much it will cost? 
where we are currently and if there are any expected delays on the ride and what are those reasons for the delays. And if there is a delay, the floor will present time estimation and uh, so you can assess like how long you should wait. And then if the delay is very significant, the passenger will see suggestions for nearby places and then they can decide if, uh, to drop off the bus if they want. And the last interaction we designed, uh, um, we found to play external information from outside the vehicle inside the bus. So as an example, we chose to uh, display the weather. So if it's raining outside or if there's a heat wave, we can just present it and play it inside the bus. And we thought here it can be more playful and to, we can create something that will be interactive and the animation can react to the passenger's position on the floor and play around it. So it's, um, it can be also like a nice way to um, pass the time. Okay, so we have designed and we mapped it from like very abstract uh, interactions to uh, informative, uh, which is great. But in order to gain a better understanding, uh, we need to test it on real people and to let others experience this and learn from their reactions and feedbacks and thoughts. Uh, and for that reason, we've built an actual prototype and Yuri will share about uh, the process. Thanks, Romy. Thanks, uh, Tom. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, really exciting to be here. Um, so yeah, as uh, Tom mentioned, um, uh, here in the DLX Design Lab in New Tokyo, we really believe in uh, thinking through making. We really like to make physical things and go through very iterative processes um, to learn and to think as we as we go through this process. Um, so this was this project was no different. Uh, so the moment we uh, started making these interfaces, we realized that we very quickly need to actually put them into the real world, take them outside of our screen. Uh, so we put together we started putting together a simple prototype. Uh, we took a big screen television, uh, put it underneath a like very thick sheet of glass so we can just stand on it and started projecting these uh, ripples on them. See how they feel underneath our feet when we walk uh, on something on a screen. And what, what does, how does it even make us feel? Does it make any sense? Uh, maybe it makes you nauseous. Maybe it's, uh, does this information even useful in any way. Uh, and we very soon realized that we need a sensor to actually, the system needs to be aware of where the user, where the, and the passenger is. So we started experimenting with different sensors as well. So here you can see a very first test with a sensor on the ceiling. It's a little heat sensor, uh, which we very soon realized that is not so useful in this scenario because the television gets hot after a while and the user gets swollen inside the screen. Um, so we moved on, uh, Tom. Uh, uh, I'll get back to the sensors in a minute, uh, but as we were developing the screen and the interfaces as well, while Tom was working on the interfaces and mapping uh, the different types of uh, interactions, we realized that to make it even more immersive, we actually should make this, uh, it, the, the screen it, itself is not enough. We should build like a little bus mock-up, uh, which we can have inside our lab before we even, so the future vision is actually implementing it in, in a real bus scenario. But just for testing, for quick testing, we decided to make it more bus-like. So we started building this frame around it. Um, can we go to the next slide? Um, so yeah, we did. We went through lots of sketches, and these sketches were very quickly translated to the physical thing. We thought putting it like a box on wheels, if we actually need to move it. We thought about implementing it in a VR scenario. Uh, maybe even uh, do small mockups uh, where you put a little. Uh, model on an on an iPad or an or an uh, iPhone just to simulate uh, and demonstrate this, uh, make it more portable. Uh, can we move on? Uh, and this is our current and latest uh, uh, version of this uh, mock-up. So you can see the this television screen with this uh, uh, robust glass on top of it. There's a seat we bought from an old bus and a little bit of posters around it just to make you feel a little bit more inside of a bus. Uh, we can easily transport it from place to place, so we can test it in the lab, but we can also take it to another lab or somewhere outside of a campus to an exhibition anywhere. Uh, can we go to the next slide? I think, Tom, you, there's a overlay. Yeah, can we go to the next slide? Um, 
And uh, just going quickly back to the sensors bit, uh, we also tested different ways of uh, detecting the passenger. So we used uh, different, um, basically, posture detection algorithms. Uh, but in the end, uh, we for now, we're just using a very simple LiDAR sensor. So the same thing you have on autonomous vehicles, which detect people uh, and objects around it, we use to detect people, and passengers inside uh, the bus. Um, and all right, Tom, can we do next slide? Um, and basically today what we have is uh, the, basically the interface that you've seen that Sean, Tom showed you a few minutes ago, uh, we have them interactive. Um, we have an interactive version of them implemented on this prototype and you can basically onboard a bus and get a feedback while you move around this little uh, square it tracks you, uh, it gives you those payment reminders, gives you information about your ride, uh, and also shows you some of the ambient uh, interactions, uh, which Tom mentioned, sorry. Um, and yeah, basically at the moment, it's a state of emergency here in Tokyo. So we, unfortunately we cannot invite uh, people to our lab to test it, but as soon as it's gonna be lifted up, Hopefully we'll start uh, inviting people and in, uh, run experiments with this interface, see how effective it is. And if I still have another few minutes, we have a short video just to summarize. Uh, Sigal, do we have uh, two more minutes left? Three? Go ahead. <laughs> Let's see the video. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, Tom. You're welcome. Let's play it. We are curious. <laughs> <so>. <laughs> The project Ripple started over a year ago in January 2020 with a one week treasure hunting project where a team from Bezalel came over and joined DLX designers. The project was looking at the future of mobility. So after the one week treasure hunting workshop, we had a number of interesting concepts. Being Design Lab, we really wanted to bring those to life. So we've built a mock-up bus. When we started working on this project, the scenario we had in mind was of someone onboarding an, an empty autonomous bus. It was clear to us that there's a need for some kind of basic layer of communication. So our concept was to design an interactive bus floor that will enable communication between the autonomous bus and the passenger. So essentially what Ripple is, is a communication display that can tell where people are. So the first thing the bus does is to put up a display around your feet to essentially uh, acknowledge that you've boarded the bus. We also created a personalized display that gives information about the ride. For example, how many stops until the final destination, what is the weather there, and what is the cost of the ride. The passenger can also see anticipated delays and the reasons. So for example, if there are construction works or traffic and so on. We aren't at the situation where people trust technology enough. So this system is, is about creating another layer of communication between people and technology. So actually, if you think about it, by making the vehicle a platform for communication, we can create a positive experience and build trust for the passenger just by supplying their needed information. All right, so yeah, thank you very much. And one last thing, uh, Tom, last slide, uh, I guess we had a team in Bezalel which was leading the project uh, and the team here. Um, but also this project would not be possible without the constant feedback we got from the mobility labs here at the University of Tokyo at the Intelligent Transport System Center. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody. Thank you, Omi. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thanks very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for uh, three very interesting lectures. Uh, if there are any questions, um, if not, maybe I I'll start. I know we have not so much time, but uh, I'm curious. Uh, we heard three very different lectures that relate to algorithm algorithms and uh, human uh, 
uh, and the and humanity and our human creatures, the users, whatever we call them. And I'm I'm curious uh, um, uh, to ask all three all three three four, five of you. <laughs> Uh, if you can you speculate uh, uh, the the future of of being human or human relations vis-a-vis -vis, uh, those algorithmic uh, situation? Anyone? <laughs> I think it would be impossible to answer in the time that we have. <laughs> it is such a, a huge question. Um, so maybe I will just tackle and I will improvise. Um, okay. I, I think that uh, from what we heard this morning is that uh, everything is human moves uh, or is based on possibly descriptions and there's a lot of uh, emotions and biases encoded in there. However, when we look at our machines, we assume that they are uh, flawless, that they, that they move to observations that have more science, less uh, humanity in them. So um, humans uh, that are relying on more and more on algorithms that are of course inflicted with our own biases, um, I think should be more cautious, skeptical, and yet uh, as the entire society goes to this direction, should also be optimistic and as we heard earlier this morning, um, we should approach, approach with uh, caution and try to understand what it is that we try to advance, what it is that uh, we as human want and what should be humane technology um, as uh, those presentations today try to show. I would just like to add that, well, I think in many ways, the risk is not, um, losing uh, full authority to the AI. It's more about um, us adopting uh, too much of a computerized state of mind, or maybe, you know, it's not about making technology more human. It's unfortunately about how technology makes us more like code, uh, programs us in many ways. Um, mm -hmm. I saw it specifically in the, in the notion of language, um, communicating with non-human entities, with bots, with AI assistants, uh, lower uh, the number of words in your vocabulary, makes you sound more authoritative, uh, use specific words and not others. So there's many vocabulary changes here that are going on. And I worry that language is just one example. Uh, we might end up treating humans as we treat our non-humans companions, so to speak. So that's that's where I that's what I fear from the most. Okay, uh, I kind of like uh, uh, understand that uh, this uh, artificial intelligence uh, approach uh, give us. Uh, new new perspectives and new possibilities for interaction uh, of uh, the technology and, and the human uh, and human interaction with, with the architecture and that uh, we can uh, we can kind of uh, invoke or uh, give architecture the, the behavioral qualities of the of the human and uh, the, the architecture can become uh, more more responsive, more interactive, uh, and more attentive to to human individuals uh, that are appearing in architectural space. And uh, that's uh, kind of on the level of uh, democratization of, of the space and architecture. So, yeah, like I think there is a potential of uh, of this technology for uh, for kind of. Uh, enhancing or augmenting the, the behavioral qualities of our environment. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. I think uh, we're in, in a point that the word personalized became uh, uh, through mach machine language, something that takes us, questions our individuality in, in a very, uh, dangerous and interesting way. And I think uh, 
uh, we should look into this gap or uh, uh, unifying uh, um, um, states. So I thank you very much. It was very, very interesting. And of course, uh, we could have discussed it for uh, very long, but uh, as we are human and not machines, I guess we have to have coffee or eat something. Finally, Yael. <laughs> so thank you very much.